Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Knox World Oceans Day celebrations. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Alice Horton, who is going to head up a panel uh, of Dr. Michael Clare, uh, Professor Richard Lampitt, and Freya Radford. Um, and this evening's topic is covering plastics. So I will hand over to uh, Alice, and uh, we'll have Q&A at the end of this session. Great. Thank you. Um, I don't know whether to wait a couple of minutes. People still seem to be arriving. Or would you prefer that I just start? <laughs> I think we're okay to start. Okay, great. Okay, so um, thank you to those who've joined us today. I hope you've um, had a good day so far at the open day and that you've had a chance to see some of the sessions that have been running already. Um, we're excited to be here this evening to present to you some of our work that we're doing at Knock on Microplastics. Uh, my name is Dr. Alice Horton. Um, and I'm really excited to be able to uh, have this discussion with you today. So hopefully you'll have some questions as we go through. Um, I would ask that you put these in the chat box uh, and we can address these as we go. So um, I'm here with some of my colleagues who've just been introduced, but I will introduce them again. Uh, we're part of the Microplastic Research Group here at the National Oceanography Centre in Southampton. Now, I'm sure that you've heard about microplastics and plastics in the environment. Um, there's, I guess, a reason why you're here this evening. Um, so we want to tell you a bit about what we're doing with microplastics. Um, there may be some things that you've heard in the media that we might want to discuss in a bit more detail. Um, but in, in brief, uh, what we believe to be microplastics as researchers uh, tends to be defined as something that's less than five millimetres in size, a plastic particle that's less than five millimetres in size, uh, but the smallest size limit would be one micron. So this is around 20 times thinner than the uh, diameter of a human hair. So the actual range in sizes that, that could be covered by the, the term microplastics is actually very large indeed. We know the sources of microplastics to be really diverse. So uh, there are lots of things that we need to think about when we're looking at microplastics in the environment, where they might have come from uh, and so on. So um, as a group, we are looking at things like where are microplastics coming from? How are they getting into the environment? What happens to them once they're there? How are they transported? Um, what the kind of ecological implications of that uh, and so on. So uh, just to introduce my colleagues, we have um, here in the whichever, I don't know where these people are on your screen. So um, we have Professor Richard Lampitt. He is a professor of biogeochemistry uh, in Southampton as well. Um, and he's interested especially in where plastics uh, come from and how they get into the oceans, but also their interaction with other matter. So organic or inorga inorganic matter and nutrients that are in the oceans and the implications this has for the biogeochemistry. We also have Freya Radford, who is a PhD student at the National Oceanography Centre and the University of Southampton. And her research focuses especially on plastics on land. So looking um, especially at microplastics uh, in agricultural soils and how they get into soils, um, but also looking at methods for identifying and extracting these, because we know that microplastics are very small uh, and therefore we have to use quite a lot of different techniques to be able to look at these within the environment. Then we have Dr. Mike Clare, um, and he's a sedimentologist, and he's especially interested in how we might be able to look at microplastics from a sedimentological perspective. So do they behave like sediments? Uh, and what does this mean for their fate and where they end up once they enter the oceans? Uh, thinking about things like, do they end up in the deep sea? Uh, I'm Dr. Alice Horton, um, and I'm an environmental scientist and an ecotoxicologist. So my interest lies especially in the biological and ecological effects of microplastics um, and that what this might mean for ecosystems and populations if we think about the fact that our environment is already changing and we're putting a lot of plastic into it. So that's just a very broad overview of the kind of things that we do. Um, and hopefully you'll have a few questions already, but uh, what I'm gonna do is just start off with a bit of a chat uh, with my colleagues about some of the things that we are interested in and some of the questions that we're trying to address. Um, and then as you think of things, maybe you can put them into the chat as well. So I'm gonna start with Freya because uh, I think we should maybe start at the upstream end of this question. So microplastics on land. And a lot of people might be thinking, you know, if, if we're talking about microplastics in the ocean, why do we care about plastics on land? You know, how do they, how do they get into the oceans? Yeah, it's a good question because obviously a lot of uh, the research that we see is about plastic in the oceans. However, most of the plastic that we generate 
and uses uh, it's used and disposed of on land. So a large proportion of the plastic that we see in the ocean has probably come from the land in the first place. So uh, there are lots of different sources of plastic on land. And the one that I'm specifically interested in, like you mentioned, Alice, is microplastics um, in agricultural soils that come from sewage sludge. Um, so sewage sludge, for those of you that don't know, is applied as a fertilizer to agricultural soils and um, has been shown in quite a few different studies now. And one of your recent ones, Alice, I think, showed that um, it contains a lot of microplastics, which uh, get into the wastewater treatment plants and from general like day-to-day -day activities such as washing your clothes so synthetic garments shed um, microplastics in the form of microfibers um, in the washing process and then that can get into the wastewater treatment process um, and end up in sewage sludge which then ends up on our agricultural fields so these microplastics can then get into the agricultural systems and have the potential to be transported into aquatic systems through runoff or um, windblown microplastics as well. And eventually this will end up in the oceans. So we need to look at it as one big system, looking at the source where the plastics are coming from to be able to tackle where we see them ending up, which obviously is the ocean. Yeah. Um, and this is a question that I will um, lead on to Richard uh, with, which is more about the more general sources of plastics and microplastics, because you've mentioned their sewage sludge, which we know is potentially quite a big source of microplastics to land when it's applied. But we also know that microplastics are derived from lots of other materials and products. So would you like to elaborate on that a bit, Richard? Yes, well, <clears throat> So they come from all, all over the show, basically, um, and because they're such a, an important part of our, our society and we use them in all sorts of different ways. So we think that most of it comes from land and even the amount that comes from land is not actually very certain as opposed to that which comes from the maritime and fishing industry. But we think that most of it comes from land. So it's a mixture of um, big particles which are disposed of uh, into rivers, for instance, um, uh, those that are washed off uh, roads, for instance, where road markings and tires, they all got microplastics or bits of plastic which break down, uh, to going to perhaps legacy uh, um, rubbish tips as well. And we've got some amazing pictures of rubbish tips in the north uh, west of England where the sea has started to erode. So these are old rubbish tips which have been sealed off and then the sea has eroded the shoreline and you end up with this rubbish tip and therefore being exposed to the elements. So every time there's a bit of there's a storm it goes in and washes out a bit, a bit more rubbish and goes into the ocean and most of this rubbish is plastic uh, of all sorts from milk crates to plastic sheeting to all sorts of things like that. So that's so the, the the sources of it are really pretty wide and, uh, and and diverse and of course these are lots of different types of plastic and that's something we're very interested in is well how do the different types of plastic behave you know we tend to think that if it's um, some expanded polyurethane it's 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 going to float and it's in big big lumps but it, but Actually, there's all sorts from the bottle that you may have, which actually will have several different types of plastic in it. And they all will behave in different ways when they break down. So they then go into the, into the oceans and that's where we end up with all sorts of interesting processes and very important processes which, which change it. And eventually, um, it, some of it will be lost from the system over a period of time. I don't know whether you want me, Alice, to go into that that issue of how long it lasts. Perhaps that, that's a second. Maybe let's question. let's uh, come back to that one. <laughs> and <laughs> <Because I'm> question. <laughs> <laughs> you've led me nicely to a question that I had for Mike uh, because we see in the media all these images of plastics floating on the surface of the ocean, but you've just alluded, Richard, to the fact that different plastics will behave in different ways. So. Can you elaborate, Mike, on because you've done some research which has found microplastics in the deep sea, for example. Why are we finding plastics in the deep sea if a lot of it would actually float on the ocean? Yeah, it's a good question. And I think, you know, a lot, lot of the public interest in plastics has been motivated by the, the talk of garbage patches in the middle of the Pacific, for example. And 
certainly a lot of plastic does float uh, and surface currents and waves focus this plastic, the floating plastic or buoyant plastic, as we would call it, into these, these gyres, these kind of whirlpools within the middle of the ocean. Um, more than 50% of plastic, it's thought, that's actually been produced has a density that is greater than seawater. So it actually sinks. Um, and as Richard said, plastic, once it gets to the ocean, all sorts of different things happen to it. So in the same way as barnacles cling to the side of boats, all sorts of organisms like to cling to this floating material. So even the stuff that floated can become heavier, whether it gets coated with algae or the kind of slime from different organisms or attached by barnacles, it can end up sinking. And, and as Richard said, there's different types of plastics. Um, and that's really why I got interested in this problem, because I study particles of, of sand and mud and how they get transferred from rivers to the deep sea. Um, and plastic is just a different type of sediment, a different type of particle as far as I'm concerned, but it behaves in slightly weird ways. It can break down and become much smaller, as Richard has said. It can come from all sorts of different sources. Um, when we've gone hunting for it and, and we found it everywhere we go looking for, it. it's not just us, it's other scientists from around the world looking at the deep sea floor. We find microplastics in particular in the seafloor sediments. Um, and where we find the highest concentrations isn't necessarily close to the places where sediment is washing, where, where, where plastic and waste is washing off from land. Quite often it's very far away from that. And, and we find that there are currents like there are on the surface operating on the deep sea floor. And these are, are distributing and, and, and moving microplastics around and locally creating what we call hot spots of them. So a bit like the garbage patch that's talked about on the surface of the ocean. We find those sorts of hot spots in the deep sea. But it is worth stressing that when you hear that garbage patch term, it's not, as people have said, like an island you can walk on. It's more like a soup of plastic. And in the same way, we find high concentrations. But if you looked at the sand and the mud in itself, quite often you really wouldn't see very much there. So we think that these deep sea currents are very important. It's estimated that, that maybe less than 1% of the plastic that's entered the ocean actually floats on the surface. And the rest is in all sorts of different places. Richard's done work showing that lots of it is actually in the water column. And we have, you know, thousands of meters of water that can have microplastics in. But ultimately, a lot of it ends up on the bottom of the sea. Um, and that's where a lot of important animals live. So it's, it's super important to understand how much is where uh, and whether it coincides with, with important habitats for, for where vulnerable organisms live. And it's very early days for that work. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's still a lot that we don't really understand, for sure. Um, so one of the things you'd mentioned is about accumulation hotspots. And this, I guess, is a question both for you, Mike, and for you, Richard, because it, it links to what you were sort of moving on to say earlier, is, you know, what does this mean? Does it stay there then? Is it likely to leave those systems? How long is it likely to be within the system, whether it's the deep sea or the water column? So I don't know. Which of you would like to address that? Do you want to start with the water column, Richard? Oh, you're on, on mute. mute. <laughs> Jeepers, we'd have thought I'd have learned now. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, yes, the issue of how long it's, it stays there is one which is really, really important. I mean, a lot of people in the public media, they say this stays for thousands of years. It's with us more or less forever. And, Actually, the evidence for that isn't very strong, but it may certainly last a long time. So what we've been really trying to do is to figure out how long it does stay there. And so the very, very simple way of, of calculating that from the water column is to say how much is flowing into the ocean, and we've got sort of estimates of that, and how much is there actually in the ocean. And if you can get those two numbers, you can say, well, in that case, this amount of it has been lost and gone down to Mike's patch, basically going down to the, to the seabed, uh, first of all, and then into the geological sediment. But actually what we found when we looked to see how much was actually in the water, we found there was more in the water than we thought we'd ever put in. So then you end up with a really, you can't do the sums. You can't, you can't, you can't make it work because, but, but we certainly do believe that it, it lasts for a reasonably, well, no, we don't know how long it lasts, but let's say it, it lasts for 10 years, then you'd expect that 
if we stop putting it in immediately, completely, which is obviously impossible, then in 10 years time, it would all be gone. But actually, we don't know what that number is. And that's a really crucial one if we're going to understand how much of a, do we have a crisis? Is this really, really, are we in a, a terrible, terrible situation? Or is it one of those things where we say, if we modify our lifestyles, our way the human beings live, then things will in time get better. So then probably go over to over to Mike. <laughs> well, I, I appreciate yeah. that you, you've given me domain over the global uh, seafloor of the ocean. <laughs> Is that uh, enough for you, Mike? <laughs> that, that's, that, that sounds enough for me. Yeah, I like it down in the mud. And uh, I, I, I think it's certainly one place where the sediments so are these sands and muds that end up on the on the seafloor on the bottom of the ocean. Uh, they, they play an important part in telling a story of, of kind of that legacy of plastic pollution. So several studies recently have shown, particularly in, in coastal environments, and Alice has shown in, 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 in lakes and freshwater systems, that um, you can start to look through the sediments that are deposited on top of each other and, and use it almost like a, a forensic story to tell you what's happened. And certainly there's evidence in some, some areas that plastics from you know, the 1950s and, 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 and beyond, you can tell a story about how kind of our mismanagement of waste has actually occurred and developed. Some, some of the work that we're doing is it's almost stamp collecting. You, you go and you take a sample. So we, we take a, a sediment core. So we push a tube into the seafloor and we extract that. We bring it back. We open it up and we look at the, the amount of microplastics there are in the sediments. But we need to remember this. This is a snapshot in time. This tells us what's happened up to that point. Um, and hopefully from some of the other presentations throughout the day, the people who've attended will realize that the seafloor can be quite a dynamic place. And so currents can become faster over time, maybe in the winter compared to the summer or in light of ongoing climate change. And so that plastic which gets locked up in the sediment sometimes can be released and it can be moved somewhere else. So it's important to have these studies that document where plastic is, but also understand the processes on the surface, in the water column and on the seafloor. Um, and that includes ocean currents, but also the role of organisms, because some, some bugs like to, to eat their way into the seafloor and they, they will basically produce that material back into the water column. So when we think about the fate of plastic, it's very complicated and we really need to understand the ocean as a whole. Once something ends up on the seafloor, it doesn't always stay there. But Richard talked about you know, geological time. It's highly feasible that some types of the litter that we have put down may have a long-term geological uh, fingerprint somehow. Um, I'm interested in that, but generally, I guess we are most interested as, as a society in, in what's there now and what's gonna be there in a few years time and what impact that will have on us. Uh, and I guess, Alice, a question for you then is, is about, you, know, you talked about ecotoxicology, but like how bad are the impacts of plastics or, or do we not know yet? Yeah, it's a good question. And I think what I would say to that is that it's probably not as bad yet as a lot of people think it is. So we see a lot in the media about, you know, plastics killing all the wildlife, uh, especially when you think about big plastics like plastic bags and bottles and so on. But the trouble with microplastics is that we haven't really been studying it for very long. And it also hasn't been in the environment for very long in the grand scheme of things. We've only really been using plastics for the last 50 or 60 years or so. Whereas if you think about a human life, you know, there are people alive today who who were around, you know, when plastics were invented even. So, you know, it's a, it's a very new material. And for that reason, we don't really understand very well what the effects are because we see that it gets ingested by organisms. We see in lots of different studies that there are a variety of animals that will eat it. And also we do see that this can have health effects. So uh, it might not necessarily kill them outright. In fact, a lot of the time it doesn't. But what we do see is that the fact that their gut is full of plastic means that they can't then ingest their regular food. So they have then reduced energy supplies and their reduced fitness. Um, it can lead to things like uh, a reduction in growth or impact on reproduction. Uh, and these are the very sort of low level subtle effects that can actually have longer term impacts on populations. So we know that you know, if reproduction is reduced, then we're not gonna have so much of the replenishing of the population into the future. The other thing to mention is that different species will respond in different ways. So some are a lot more sensitive than others. 
So we might see some organisms being affected much more badly than others. And this is where people are doing a lot of research on lots of different organisms across, you know, fish, birds, invertebrates, bacteria, and so on, just to really try and understand what these effects are. Because as it stands, we can't say plastics are harmful or plastics are not harmful because we really don't understand what that's going to mean long term. So I hope that that kind of answers your question. <laughs> I could go on. but <laughs> um, So I, I'm going to kind of slightly move on, although we can come back to any of these questions if anybody would like to. But I wanted to pose a question to Freya because she's been doing a lot of work on the development of methods for how we look at microplastics in the environment. Obviously, they're very small, so we can't necessarily just, you know, get a plastic in our hand and look at it. So what are the kind of techniques that you would have to use to try and quantify and determine plastics in the environment? Yeah, another good question, because that's something that we really are developing at the moment as a whole research community. There's a lot of um, discrepancy between the methods that people are using because it is a relatively young field and we are trying lots of different things to see what works best. So there are lots of different uh, points in the, the process. So going from environmental um, sampling, so actually collecting uh, your, your sample of soil, sediment, water, whatever it is. Uh, there's lots of different methods that you can use for that. So, for example, with the soil cores that I take, um, I want to make it sure I've got a representative sample across the field. So you have to take multiple cores across uh, different fields that are treated in uh, similar ways across an environment. Um, and similar with water, people filter lots of water or they use uh, plankton nets to collect the plastics. Um, so there's lots of different strategies that you could use at that point. And then when you get to the lab, you have another, um, another set of methods that are available for you. So that depends on your sample. So uh, again, with my uh, soil samples, I have the problem of lots of organic matter in them and then um, lots of minerals, so lots of sand and clay in the, um, the soils, which you need to separate from the plastic. So to do that, we use things like density separations with um, high density salt solutions that um, you can literally float the plastics to the top of your, um, your sediments or your, your soils or whatever you're looking at and extract them off that way and filter them out so that you can look at them like that. But then you also need to factor in the organic matter that you need to get rid of, which um, needs to be digested away, um, generally using things like uh, hydrogen peroxide um, or uh, people have used acids, but then you have the problem of whether that's going to affect the integrity of the plastic that you're looking at as well. So there's lots of trial and error to try and find the right method at that point. And then once you have eventually separated out your plastics, you need to be able to identify what you're looking at. So what kind of polymers you've got and what sort of shapes and sizes you've got, because size is another one where our methods are currently limited to um, different size ranges. So uh, lots of the methods that we look at at the moment go down to uh, maybe 10 microns in size. And we're also starting to look at, as a uh, research community, nanoplastics as being a potential issue. So we need a whole new analytical methods for that. So I expect in the next few years, there'll be a lot of progress and we'll be doing things differently. But um, yeah, there, there's a lot of variety in it at the moment and a lot of methods that are available. So in short, it's very complicated. It is. <laughs> yeah. Time consuming. <laughs> yeah. So I think, yeah, the kind of key point of that really is that the larger something is, the easier it is to handle, you know, as, as you would expect, you know, as humans, we're designed to look at things that you can pick up and see with your eyes. And when we start looking at microplastics, that becomes not so easy because we stop being able to see them with our naked eye and then we have to use all these different techniques. So, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> good overview. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to move on um, to the kind of more broad questions that people might be wondering about. And I'm going to kind of link two questions together here, but maybe whoever wants to can address these in different ways. So the first kind of question that I want to pose here is, do we think that plastics are the biggest problem that the ocean is facing right now? And related to that, do we think that we should ban plastics, you know, to stop them getting into the environment? So... I know that Richard is itching to answer this question. <laughs> maybe he'll give, you know, a good response to that. And maybe somebody else might have an opinion as well. Yeah, I'm sure everybody's got an op uh, opinion about it. <laughs> um, I think the first, the first thing is to 
sort of state the obvious that plastics, because they're such an important part of our life, they do an awful lot of good things. I mean, they, from keeping food fresh, from transporting water to uh, developing countries where there's a shortage, nice clean water, uh, so to the me medicines, keeping, you know, they do an enormous amount of good things come from plastics. So those who say that this is a really, that it should be banned, really are, are not really living in the real world. And I don't think at the moment, they're not thinking very clearly. Um, other sorts of plastic, obviously industries thinking very hard about developing other sorts of plastics. So the, the first, first answer to that would be, we, it's completely impractical that we should ban plastics. Um, the other part of whether they, sorry, what was the other part of that, that question? Is it, are they the biggest problem the that the ocean is facing? The biggest problem. Well, I'm, I, I've spent much of my career working on downward particle flux basically taking carbon out of, out of the upper part of the water column and into the deeper part of the water column. So this process reduces the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and reduces global warming. So my own feeling is that actually we, it, this, this, at the moment we couldn't put our hands on our hearts and say, this is the most important uh, threat that, is, that the environment is facing. There are lots of others and you could cite ones such as global poverty and malnutrition and wars and all those sorts of threats. But from an environmental point of view, you'd probably say actually the changes as a result of carbon dioxide or greenhouse gases are quite a lot more serious and are the confidence in that those changes is much higher. So we, we really do have a, a good feeling that what is likely to happen to the oceans uh, the rising of increasing temperature, the rising of sea level, uh, all the, the all these uh, decrease in in pH, they become more becoming more acidic. So these are things which are definitely going to change and are definitely going to change the environment. So I wouldn't put it at the top of the list, but it it is potentially. And my final point is it it has the potential to cause a lot of damage to the ecosystem. And if that's the case, and if they last a long time, it's going to be really, really hard to solve the problem. So, yes. that's, so it's really difficult to solve it. So the one thing that I would add to that before I let uh, Mike speak, because I see that he's ready, <laughs> um, is that it may not be the biggest problem. And we, we think that maybe it isn't, but actually it is another problem on top of all the other problems that already exist. So whether it works in isolation as a hazard to the environment, or it works in combination with all the other hazards that are going on in terms of global warming, ocean acidification and overfishing and pollution and everything, we know that it's not gonna be doing any good to the environment. So there are still arguments for saying, actually, this is something we should think about. This is something we need to keep researching and we should tackle it. Mike. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I agree with you, Alice, and I, I was going to say something along along similar lines that it's it's one of those things, right? It's uh, just just because something isn't the biggest problem doesn't mean it isn't a problem, and we shouldn't do something about it. Um, and Richard makes some really good points about how useful plastic is and how it has replaced all sorts of other materials that would be far more harmful for the environment. So. Um, we certainly need to think about this. And this is, I guess, part of what the National Oceanography Center does. It's about understanding the health of the ocean. And if lots of little things are chipping away at the health of the ocean, as Richard says, if climate change is, is you know, it's making some organisms more vulnerable or it's, it's, it's damaging other habitats, you don't need other stuff on top of it to cause a problem. That, that being said, you know, the, the the, the use of plastic to, let's say, Richard gave one example of, of making food packaging uh, and, and allowing food to last longer. What you don't want then is your behavior to say, well, that means that we can just ship food from further away. And then you get more emissions as a result of shipping or, or air freight. What we should be doing is changing our beha behavior more generally, thinking about everything, thinking about climate change and plastic use. And a lot of, as Richard said, a lot of the plastic and stuff that we've put into landfills, in some cases, is entering the natural environment again, as a result of climate change and sea level rise and increased storms on the northwest coast. So this, everything is kind of somehow interlinked there. 
So if we, we think more carefully about our behavior of, of recycling and reusing things rather than being disposable, if we try and get food that is sustainable and is being delivered more locally and we're reliant less on, on buying stuff from far away, um, then plastic definitely has a purpose and, and a place. So I don't think it is a question about banning because banning is a very easy thing, right? It's a binary way of viewing the world. Yes or no, this is good, this is bad. Um, we know we use materials, we know we throw materials away and we certainly should be doing a lot more. And I think that's where we all have a part to play. We can certainly put pressure on governments and, uh, and organizations, but ultimately it's, it's ourselves that are responsible for what we decide to throw away or what we decide to reuse. Um, so I, I think everything is pretty much closely interlinked and I totally agree with, with Richard's point that uh, it's very visible. I think what plastic is, is a very useful tool to communicate that the oceans are under pressure. Um, and it, it, it puts that into people's minds because plastic is visible, um, the, you know, the big bits of it. And so that helps people start thinking about the ocean and being more responsible. Great. Thanks, Mike. Um, so I'm going to just uh, ask one more question because we're coming to the end of our time. I just want to encourage anybody who has any questions to put them in the chat. This is probably your last chance to get us to answer one of your questions. So please do that. Um, if you did think of something later that you hadn't thought of now, um, then you can go to the um, portal for our open day online. And then you can go to the speakers room uh, under the networking tab and you can ask questions there that we can we can answer at a later date. So do feel free to do that. Um, so just to kind of wrap up, I was gonna continue just along the theme of, of what we can do to sort of help this problem. And maybe Freya, you have a couple of ideas of, of what you personally might do to try and reduce your plastic usage. And you know, small things all add up, we know that. So, so what can we do, even if it's small? <laughs> Yeah, definitely. It's something that's gotten so much attention recently that there actually are becoming a lot of alternative products available that you can use instead of plastic. Um, so it is thinking about trying to minimise your use, I guess, rather than maybe cut it out completely because that might not be possible um, and working out how you can fit it into your life specifically. So uh, maybe remembering to take your, your bags to the supermarket so that you don't get one of the, um, the plastic bags from there or asking to not have a straw in your drink although yeah they've now um banned those in uh drink like bars or restaurants so um i guess it's trying to work out what alternatives you can use so um i know there's lots of initiatives for having uh, reusable uh water bottles and uh, lots of drinking water points around uh cities that uh make it more freely available to do that sort of thing so i guess it is all of those those little things that do add up and make a difference and trying to work out how you can incorporate that into your day-to-day -day life. Um, but yeah, just, just trying to do as much as you can, but without trying to put too much pressure and acknowledging that we can't completely get rid of plastic. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, so while you've been talking for our questions come in for you actually. So okay. uh, I'm gonna go ahead. This is from Arturo Castillo, who I actually know. Hello, Arturo. <laughs> he, he knows a bit about this. So he's got a question for you, um, which is what do you think is the comparative size or I guess proportion of the instance of land microplastic from agricultural single use plastic versus microplastics from sewage? So I guess the question is like, what's the most important? Is it sewage sludge or is it agricultural plastic use? Yeah, that's actually a question that we don't necessarily have an answer to at the moment um, and something that I am working on. So I'm trying to look at how much uh, sewage sludge is adding to land because we know that it's um, putting, there is a lot of plastics in the sewage sludge and we know that we're spreading a certain amount onto land, but yet we're still finding plastics in fields that have never had sewage sludge applied to them. So there are other potential sources. So. Uh, in some areas, they use uh, plastic mulch to increase um, crop yield. So they'll, they'll use sheets of plastic across soils um, that can uh, essentially increase soil temperatures and uh, increase water retention, which is great in terms of crop yields. But then that plastic is um, subjected to UV um, radiation and it, it gets broken down into the soil and we're seeing lots of uh, plastic in those sort of areas and equally just in day-to-day -day farming practices so things like silage wrap or baler twine are used uh, all over farmlands and you see them I've seen them in all of the fields that I sample and not just the ones with sewage sludge 
uh, and also a lot of littering. So um, particularly in fields that are adjacent to roads, you see a lot of litter around. So whether or not the sewage sludge is the biggest source is hopefully something that I can uh, shed a bit of light on eventually. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, we don't know for sure yet. <laughs> No, I would agree. I think there hasn't been enough. You know, we've looked at what there are microplastics in sludge, but we haven't done enough research to look at then what are the kind of volumes of microplastics that are therefore applied to land in sludge and is that retained and so on. So, yeah, there's a lot of a lot of stuff that we don't know yet about microplastics in soils. Definitely. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So um, if there aren't any more questions, then I think I'll wrap up unless anybody has any burning points that they haven't managed to say during this, this discussion. Don't see any eager faces. So um, with that, I will wrap up. So thank you to those who've attended uh, and for listening to us and hearing about our work. If you do have any more questions, then uh, pop them onto the speaker room in the chat via the uh, online portal and uh, we will respond you know, as soon as we can to those, I'll, I'll hang around for the next five minutes or so, um, or just feel free to get in touch via another route, email or whatever. So thank you and uh, goodbye.